Hi, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to my weekly podcast about spirituality, love, death, devotion, and waking up while living in a messy world. The Satsang with Shambhavi podcast is recorded live each week with students of our nonprofit community, Jayakula. For more information and to find out about attending a satsang, visit jayakula.org. Thanks for listening. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. I wanted to be reminded about the story of the Zen meditator in the Zendo. Anybody remember that story? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the one who's falling asleep, that one? Well, basically, you know, in the Zendo, the meditation master is sitting up here, and then there's two lines of meditators facing each other. It's usually kind of a rectangular mm-hmm. room. And so they're sitting on some kind of raised platforms on black Zabutans with black cushions precisely the same distance apart from each other. Mm -hmm. And the meditation master is slightly higher on his or her black cushion and black Zabutan. And then if it were a very traditional Zendo, if the meditation master thought that you weren't staying in presence, you weren't being awake, he would come around or she would come around and whack you with a stick. So this was happening, but this one fellow who was like... (laughs) The teacher wasn't whacking that person with a stick. And then at one point, the teacher comes and stands right in front of this sleeping person. And the sleeping person goes, oh, it's you. (laughs) And then what happens? The other students complain and ask, Mm -hmm. like, what's up? How come you didn't whack him? Mm -hmm. Right. How come he gets to sleep? How come you Mm -hmm. didn't whack him? And what does the teacher answer? He's the only one who gets it. Right. He's the only one who gets it. What does he get? Naturalist. Being natural. There's no competition. You're trying to be stiff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's no appearance to be held. There's no appearance to be held. There's no contrived way of being. Mm-hmm. There's no way you can be contrived and, and please the teacher. Mm-hmm. Any contrivance is not pleasing the teacher. At best, they're just shrugging. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else anyone can think of? Maybe he was tired. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He was tired, but also he didn't care if the teacher saw him being tired. He wasn't trying to present a certain image to the teacher. But also when the teacher came in front of him, he recognized him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he had enough alertness. He felt the presence of the teacher Mm -hmm. in front of him. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny how we often will wake up if someone's standing Mm -hmm. next to our bed. So this is something that's important for us to contemplate because we live in a culture where appearing a certain way is paramount. So this is the hardest thing for us to let go of, is our efforts to appear a certain way. People pretty regularly express to me that they are trying to please me or impress me, or they realize they're being fake around me in some way because they're trying to please me or impress me. And the first thing I want to say about that is there's no way that you're around the teacher, that you're not around other people. You aren't suddenly a different person (laughs) when you're around the teacher. The only thing that might be different is if it's the right teacher for you, that you actually on some level feel a kind of relief, you know, feel more of a sense of home, but that still might be encrusted with all this (laughs) other behavior. (laughs) In fact, it will be. So there's nothing that you feel around the teacher that you don't feel around other people. However, because the teacher is not in exactly the same condition as other people, because the teacher is hopefully less contrived than other people, Mm -hmm. has more clarity than maybe some other people you know, and is looking at you and actually seeing you, then those behaviors both become more apparent to you in the mirror of your teacher's relatively greater relaxation and might even become exacerbated. You might actually engage in those behaviors more frantically. You realize that you're being seen and you don't actually (laughs) want to be seen or you want to be seen in the right way, quote unquote. There's fundamentally two reasons why we behave in a contrived way around anybody, teacher or friend or anybody. One is because we are afraid of being thought badly of, and we don't want to experience that pain. 
The other is because we are afraid of impermanence. So we don't want people to go away or we don't want circumstances to go away. And we live in this Abrahamic coalition tr uh, culture where we feel that if we behave in a wrong way, we're going to be punished. It's hard for us to imagine that we might behave badly or appear in a less than optimal way or make a mistake or have a wrong opinion of some sort and not be punished with withdrawal or some sort of at least temporary breakage of intimacy. It's very hard for us to imagine. And in fact, of course, Jayakula is just made up of a bunch of regular people. <laughs> so there's lots of contrivance and lots of quote unquote mistakes and lots of bad behavior and lots of sub optimal appearings. <laughs> And nonetheless, no matter how many times I don't go away or other people don't go away or intimacy is not broken, there's still that chugging samskara that you're going to lose something if you're not behaving a certain way and showing up a certain way. Ma always said, there's nothing that can be lost except things you need to lose. You may not know you need to lose them, but <laughs> she said, there's nothing that can be lost that you don't actually need to lose. There's nothing that can be lost that is actually essential to you or mm -hmm. part of your path of waking up. Everything, even the losses, are part of your path of waking up. Ma was talking once to her principal disciple, Bhaiji, and she compared him to like a stalk of a plant with leaves. And she said, I'm going to pluck every leaf until only the shining golden stalk is left. She meant, I'm going to take away everything that's not needed, that's extraneous, till only the core, only the central channel, only what is essential remains. She also said to Gandhi one time, he had invited her to his house many times and she refused to come. I mean, she didn't refuse, like, I refuse to come to your house. She just was busy. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, once she came, but she didn't stay long. And he said, please, please stay. He was begging her as, as she was halfway out the door. And she said, if I stay, you'll lose everything. And he said, that there would be no greater occurrence in my life. That would be the best possible thing to ever happen to me. So whatever you feel you're going to lose as a result of just showing up naturally in front of other people or the teacher is only something you actually need to lose. For instance, if let's say I'm your friend and you do something you know, whatever, something I don't like or don't approve of. And I leave you, I stop being your friend. In a lot of cases, that just means I was never your friend. Mm -hmm. It might mean you were never my friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in any case, most of the time, actual friends will make space for people to be sloppy and mm -hmm. show up in a way that's less than optimal. And that goes a hundred times for the teacher. A hundred thousand times for the teacher. The other thing is that the self that you're projecting or contriving is simply your conventional, constrained, and extremely limited idea of what a better version of you would be. <laughs> I mean, really, how do you know? Since you aren't a better version of you, you are just you. <laughs> you're neither a better version of you, nor are you a worse version of you. <laughs> you simply are whatever you are in this moment. <laughs> the idea that you would know what a better version of you is, is kind of laughable. And particularly in relationship to the teacher. Most of the ways that people contrive around me are absolutely transparent to me, not always, but most of the time. And they're not anything that is, I actually think is better than who they were before they contrived that self. <laughs> Most of the time it's worse. Or just watching the process of contrivance is sort of like, you know, just waiting for someone to come around and start being real again. <laughs> it's a missed opportunity every time you try to get away with snowing your teacher. It's also a missed opportunity with other people too, because when you're doing that, you experience a loss of intimacy. So, you know, there's loneliness in relationship because you're not really being there as you. You're being there as a simulated version of you made up by you. 
Could that be good? I don't think so. <laughs> Could that possibly pass? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> and certainly when you're working with a teacher, why bother being there if that's what you're going to do? Now, of course, those behaviors have momentum. So it's, you can't just like snap your fingers and make it stop. But you could be a lot more aware of it and a lot more brave in just letting it drop. And here's the thing, because you're obsession, your maniacal obsession with doing something the right way causes you to, in saying that you are dropping the contrivance, to actually position the dropping of the contrivance as an accomplishment mm -hmm. that you will then brag about and have it be another contrivance. So you think about how to be when you're not being contrived. So now you have two versions of yourself going. The obviously contrived one <laughs> and the contrived, honest, uncontrived one. <laughs> the one who's performing uncontrivedness. Because you've made it up in advance. You've decided how you're going to be. Anytime you decide how you're going to be, you are being contrived. You're just being a character in a story. So when dropping something means you drop it and you don't put anything in its place. There can't be spontaneity without that. There can't be spontaneity when you've decided in advance what it looks like to be uncontrived. <laughs> Remember that dropping just means dropping. It's not dropping and then picking up something else. Just don't put anything in the place of the contrivance and see what happens. Now, this creates awkwardness because you don't know what to do when you're not deciding what to do <laughs> or how to say. I watch some of you crafting your sentences on Slack. I don't know how much time it takes you to craft this written version of yourself, <laughs> but more time than you have. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is you just drop it and then you're doing whatever happens, whatever happens, happens. So that means you have to be able to surf or wade or float through periods of awkwardness where you're not really doing much of anything because you've dropped the behavior, but the gateway to spontaneity hasn't quite opened wide enough yet. You have to let yourself be in that interim zone of awkwardness. You don't always have to know what to do or what to say or how to say it or how to do it. You do not need to organize your whole life around not making mistakes. I mean, can you imagine? Some of you are doing yes. that. <laughs> and there you are on your deathbed with your mistake app. <laughs> okay, I made 19,432 mistakes. I corrected them 7,432 times by editing various things. And I was perfect four times. <laughs> All according to me. <laughs> <laughs> all according to me you know what happens to clear mind don't know because really you don't know <laughs> and you aren't ever going to find out either <laughs> it's not like okay clear mind don't know clear mind don't know what am i going to know clear mind don't know <laughs> doesn't work like that because spontaneous life is just a series of unplanned responses there's no big picture there's no coherent self that you arrive at. The self already is what it is. There's nothing to arrive at or invent. And you have to be willing to not know what you're doing, or at least understand that you never did know what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Because there are going to be times during your spiritual life where you deeply, deeply, deeply have no idea what you're doing. And if, you mm. <laughs> and if you're not willing to be in those times, you won't realize because those are times of enormous fertility. So if you're always trying to figure out what you're doing and how to do it right, you will never, ever experience any kind of significant awakening. Why are those times of fertility? Because they are, speaking from personal experience. Mm -hmm. In part, they're the times when you reach for God the hardest. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's the reason necessarily, but it is something that happens. Like they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sheer desperation. <laughs> causes you to <laughs> surrender more deeply and reach more deeply for that connection.
I mean, unless you're not 100% convinced, and then you might become skeptical or walk away. Mm -hmm. But if you are convinced, then you will reach more deeply Mm -hmm. and surrender more deeply. So don't know is so, so important. Mm -hmm. 